Welcome to the award-winning Frederick Albert Sutton Building. This is the home of geology and geophysics. I'm Marjorie Chan. I was chair of the Department of Geology and Geophysics during the construction of this building, and I was responsible for many of the displays and overseeing some of the uh, programming for this special building. The Sutton Building is really a trendsetter on campus. It's the first uh, LEED certified new construction on campus, leadership in energy and environmental design. And this particular building is unusual in its displays, which are used for teaching and really to create an experiential environment that enhances the uh, learning and it actually extends our teaching in many ways. When many people come into the Sutton building, one of the things that they see are just the impressive fossil displays, and they say, wow. And this has become known as a little bit of the wow factor. And it's been decided that really many of our buildings on campus should showcase the disciplines and the academic research and teaching that goes on in the buildings. The Sutton building has created a new bar for future buildings on campus. And now new buildings on campus will also include LEED certification at the silver level and also some component of this experiential environment where some funds will be set aside for displays to showcase the academic disciplines that go on within the building. The Frederick Albert Sutton building was a cost of about $25 million. Although we initially didn't have any money for displays, we were able to get some funds from the university administration to actually furnish many of the public areas and also to have a little bit that was set aside for displays. We were able to leverage that money and many of the local companies partnered with us to really make something special happen within this building. And many of the rock slabs and displays that you see are a function of the generous support that we've received. We have about $700,000 of in-kind donations that were received for the building. So the total package of finishes and displays that you see represent about a million dollars worth on a building that was $25 million. We chose a river pattern for the Sutton building because Utah is a state that's been shaped by rivers. So the river pattern starts on the uh, dry river bed on the outside of the Xeriscape and it connects into this pattern of pebble tile encased in epoxy and you can see the sinuosity that simulates a riverbed. This is a case where we were able to work with some of the companies that donated the products and we were able to develop new uses where we tried uh, placing the stone in epoxy and this was an application that hadn't been done before. This gives an idea of a wet riverbed and sometimes it's kind of fun because students might be reading the newspaper and they actually step over the river as though it were an actual riverbed. This pattern continues here, and you can see on the first floor the river pattern picks up, it extends out towards the west, and then again picks up on the outside of the building in another one of these dry river beds in the Xeriscape. All of our rock slabs are placed in, in their position for particular reasons, and these conglomerate slabs are placed here because these are the kinds of deposits that rivers leave behind, hence the placement near the sinuous stream. These slabs are representing some of the different chemical uh, conditions. The red represents oxidized iron, the black is anoxic conditions, and the green represents some of the reduced iron. We use these slabs for teaching. Uh, students can look at the cobbles to tell some of the proximity to the source area, where these might have been derived from, such as the provenance, and some of the textures that actually can be used in interpreting some of the depositional history. This is a large eight by eight foot painting that we commissioned from John Collins, who is a local artist who received his Bachelor's of Fine Arts from the University of Utah. He comes from a family of well-known artists and painters. This particular painting is of the Permian sandstones in Canyonlands National Park. This painting also is shown in its location on the aerial photograph of the confluence picture right near the entrance to the Browning Building. In this entry open area, you can see all the round configuration with, where all the light comes in. And normally, you would want to call this a rotunda or an atrium. But it turns out that there are fire marshal rules, and we weren't allowed to call it that. Um, we said, how about a foyer or a lobby? And they said that we weren't supposed to use those names either. So one of the uh, challenges was, what are we going to call this uh, central area that's the entrance to our building? And because we had the river theme, we decided on calling this the confluence, which is a geologic concept. 
it's also where the old building and the new building come together, so it was a, a neat name for this particular entry to our building. And what we decided to do was showcase one of Utah's most famous confluences, and that is the uh, confluence of the Green and the Colorado Rivers. So in this large aerial photo, north is to the right, and you can see the confluence of the two rivers coming together and heading downstream. Um, what is nice is that also the painting that we had commissioned uh, of the Permian sandstones and canyonlands fits into this picture. And you can see the place where this particular painting comes from. It's this area right here showing the Permian sandstones that overlook the Green River. These are antique lithographs that we found rolled up in the old mines building. And these are the PowerPoints of the 1800s, essentially. These are historic scrolls, and these were printed in Germany in the 1800s. It was really fun to unravel these and find out what neat graphics they had. We decided to have these framed, and this gave us a bit of a connection to the past. During our grand opening, it was fun when some of the alums said, I remember Dr. Stokes using those in the paleontology class in the 1950s. We were fortunate to get a number of these display cases from the O.C. Tanner Company when they moved into their new jewelry store. Some of these display some unusual minerals, and this one in particular is different because it's a synthetic crystal that was actually grown during World War II in order to capture certain radio frequencies. All of the furniture in the seating areas have been color coordinated, and we have many donations that range from some of the plants to even this nice rug here. We were able to incorporate a lot of stone for the furniture, and this is where we had many of these tables custom made where we would pick out the individual stone pieces from the stone company, and then we had the university machine shops build us the bases. This enabled us to make the furniture very affordably. The fish wall is our main showpiece in the Frederick Albert Sutton building. This particular wall was designed to showcase a lot of our discipline. We have real fish fossils that are arranged like a school of fish swimming towards the lecture hall, and it kind of helps guide people into the building. You'll notice the color change in the fish wall that goes from the gray that blends with the slate at the bottom, and then it gets progressively lighter as you go up to this tan color, and then kind of finally a buff color towards the top. You'll notice that the fish are arranged in a particular order where the small fish are swimming and schooling towards the left, but some of the bigger fish that are down lower are going in different directions. And this is typical of how things occur in nature, where the big fish don't necessarily school and often live down deeper in the water. These would have been deposited in an ancient lake system. Um, you can actually see where the fossils are preserved, typically where the vertebrae are slightly sticking out. In a little bit of an oblique view, you can see that this is where they would excavate down to extract some or to expose some of the fossils. But they've gotten so good at um, extracting the fossils and doing different techniques that they can take the fossil out of one rock and actually place it into another rock. That's partly how we get this particular color variation. Some other innovations that we have introduced in this wall that are a, part, a partnership with the Green River Stone Company is that we have this nice curved wall. We have the radial cut of some of the limestone edging that occurs along the sides. Here we've tried to integrate the donor wall with the fish wall to make it really an art piece. In the donor wall we have the different names that are etched by this laser etching process into this tan colored Green River Stone. These are the four species of fish fossils um, that are represented on our fish wall. Nydia is the most common, and the most rare is this predator, where you can see here it's shown swallowing or eating another fish. The fish wall literally spawned this particular plant fossil wall. Uh, one of the generous donors and friends of the department had a wonderful palm frond that I thought would look very nice with our fish wall. I asked him if he might be interested in donating that, and he said he wasn't quite ready. But several months later, he let us know that he had 25 boxes of plant fossils in his basement that he offered to us. And it turns out that the plant fossils out of the Green River Formation are quite rare. They're very delicate, and the preservation um, is extremely fine. And um, you might find about one plant fossil for every hundred fish fossils when you actually break open or split uh, the rock along the bedding layers. There are about 200 known 
plant fossils out of the Green River Formation, and this particular collection will add about 50 new species that had never been described before. We've arranged these uh, plant fossils like leaves blowing in the wind. These are some of the plant fossils that are not quite as important for the science, but it does give you that sense of movement and draws people to the interior of our building. This display shows some nice minerals that are on loan from the Utah Museum of Natural History. We've placed these here to show that we have a partnership with the museum and we share faculty and various projects and collaboration. This display showcases some of the research of our faculty. In this case, we can date some of the layers that these uh, fossils come out of and we can understand the evolution of early man. Allosaurus is Utah State fossil and this is an unusual one-of-a-kind cast donated by one of our alum, Jeff Gentry. One of the things that was fun and actually allowed us to connect with this particular alum is that I was leading a field trip up the Big Cottonwood Canyon and a yellow Ferrari drove up. The student said, Dr. Chan, somebody in the yellow Ferrari wants to say hi to you. And I said, I don't know anybody with a yellow Ferrari, I'm sure. It turned out to be this uh, alumnus, Jeff Gentry, and he is a car collector. And for this particular specimen, he had this cast in his foundry in American Fork. And then he said, do you want my auto mechanic to build you a base so that the skull can rotate? And we said, yes, of course, we'd love that. So this is a skull that can actually rotate on its base. It's really fun because uh, kids can touch it and move it, and it shows that much of our science is very tactile. One of the things that you notice between uh, our two buildings is just the change in the technology. The Browning Building here represents the energy efficiency of the 1970s. And in the 1970s, energy efficiency meant having no windows to conserve energy. But now with uh, 2010, there's been a totally new change in the technology and particularly advances in the glass technology. So now we can have an energy efficient building while still having lots of glass. And this makes a tremendous uh, difference in the building and how it feels with all the light coming in. Uh, people say that they really feel good in the building having the natural light. This is our energy monitoring area and this is a project that was proposed by the students to actually show the amount of energy this building uses in comparison to similar buildings on campus. The Sutton building is the first LEED certified new construction on the academic campus at the University of Utah. LEED means uh, Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design. This is a certification that is sanctioned by the U.S. Building Green Council and essentially you get a certain number of points for doing things that are environmentally friendly and we were fortunate to receive enough points to uh, attain the gold level of certification. Reverend Marta Sutton Weeks is the primary donor for the Sutton Building and she wanted a building that would remember her father, Frederick Albert Sutton. This is Frederick Albert Sutton and he got his degree in, at the University of Utah in 1917. He was working during the Depression years when it was difficult to get a job in the States and so he did a lot of his work overseas and in South America. You can see from his attire that he led a life that was probably very much like Indiana Jones. And his daughter Marta kind of knew of him largely from some of the letters that he wrote home. He uh, told of many of the adventures that he had and Marta was always fascinated by the life of a geologist. Our building is actually stratified so that each floor is like some of the layering within the Earth's um, surface. So the second floor here is the floor for solid Earth and that's why we place these um, slabs here that represent some of the pieces of the solid Earth. This is one that represents a pillow basalt from Brazil. You can see some of the green coloration that are some of the iron magnesium silicates and this is where hot lava uh, bubbles up into a cold oceanic body and some of the basalt actually cracks and gives you these kinds of patterns that look very much like the back of a turtle. The other floors are uh, stratified so that we have earth history on the third floor and then earth surface processes on the top fourth floor. We placed a lot of our displays on these seismic restraint walls that are located um, close to the elevators and the restrooms where people will see some of the, the displays from our collections. Here in the signage, what we've done is if it's the second floor, there are two plant fossils. If the third floor, there are three plant fossils, etc. 
this is a slab that is particularly one from Utah. This is one that shows what we call Lisa Gang banding, and the common name for this is known as the Kanab Wonderstone. This is really remarkable in that there are mineralizing fluids that seep through the porous sandstone and leave behind these bands of iron oxide minerals. These other slabs from our collections represent uh, some of the typical things that we study in geology. These are known as trace fossils and these are uh, different markings that are made by organisms as they move through the sediment uh, for either locomotion or for food gathering. These are some examples of some ripples from the Triassic section and these are some examples of footprints made here in this ancient dune sand from the Jurassic. Our landscaping is xeriscape, and this was one of the uh, features that makes our building uh, eco-friendly or gives us some of the points that we need for the LEED certification, Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design. You can see that there are some large boulders out in the front of the building that actually signal that this is the entry to geology and geophysics. We have other large boulders that are placed in the landscape that actually match the old rock garden in front of the Browning building. Here we have a pattern that looks like a dry riverbed that's signified by these cobbles and then this connects up into a, another river pattern that extends to the inside of the building. We received a number of generous donations from some of the uh, tile and stone companies in the town and this is a particularly special piece. When they do uh, stones for kitchen counters, it's kind of like a loaf of bread. They can use the pieces on the inside where it's smooth on both sides, but pieces like this are much like the heel or what they call the end piece. We thought we could really use this end piece because it actually shows some of the natural character of the rock. This is a garnet starlight schist and you can see the uh, purple garnets. We place it here so that it will sparkle in the morning eastern light when the sun rises. You can also see that a lot of these blasting holes kind of mimic some of the corrugation on the outside of the building. We're now on the third floor and you can see that we have three fossils here on the third floor sign. And this is the floor where we do some of the studies on earth history. And so most of the rock slabs that are on the wall display, for example, fossils or sedimentary structures. These are some examples of cephalopods from the Devonian of Morocco. And we can compare these with some of its relatives from the Cretaceous Western Interior. These are some examples of large ammonites from our collection. This is our roof garden that represents one of our lead or energy efficient points. This roof garden was actually proposed by the students that were in a sustainability course and it was exciting for them to propose a project that was uh, implemented and became a reality. This particular roof garden implements four inch trays and drought resistant plants are placed in the trays and then they're watered by an automatic drip system that you can see running through here. This actually helps insulate the roof a little bit and it uh, reduces the amount of reflective glare that would normally be on the white roof that would be the norm of these particular buildings. This is a Precambrian banded iron formation. This old rock has multiple layers of different minerals that represent chert, um, hematite, and magnetite. Many of these are iron oxide minerals and we can tell what some of the minerals are by actually running the magnet over them. And to find out which one is magnetic, we find that magnetite is the one that the magnet will stick to. We use many of these rock slabs for field trips and the students can come out and try to examine what some of the mineralogies are, as well as looking at some of the deformation features in order to determine the history of these layered rocks. This is a Devonian slab from Morocco and shows a mass mortality. What made all of these cephalopods die all at once? We use all of these slabs for our teaching. We have virtual field trips where many of the students come and study these slabs to learn more about some of the earth history that's preserved. This is a palm frond donation from one of our donors. This shows the use of being able to take the uh, fossil, which was originally on a plywood board, and inset it into another piece of stone so that it actually looks like the palm frond is coming out of the surrounding rock. We also have some nice displays here of meteorites, some of which were donated to our department from uh, families and friends of the department. And here in front we have a nice example of a karst limestone and it shows some of the very uh, colorful uh, iron oxidation colors. From these west gathering areas you have a beautiful view out to the Great Salt Lake. You can see um, 
the remnant of Lake Bonneville, which is the Great Salt Lake itself. You can see the capital, and um, you can see some of the uh, Ochre Mountains over there towards the west. In this parking lot, you can see the place where our old uh, building used to be. That was the 1927 Mines Building. Um, although it was a state-of-the-art building at the time, we were unable to use it more recently because it was not ADA compliant. And it was very difficult to try to renovate that building. While it was sad to take it down, uh, what we found was that over the years, the mortar between the brick had deteriorated so that if there was an earthquake, that building would have um, been a disaster. So in reality, we were glad to be able to take that building down and replace it with a modern building that has reinforcements and is more seismically stable. The residents that have the best view in the building are our graduate students, and they are typically in some of these corner offices that have spectacular views out to the west, the um, south, and also to the east. This is the fourth floor where we do the studies on the Earth's surface and on some of the hydrology. Um, many of the slabs that are represented here are ones that were deposited by water. This particular example is a spring deposit from Pakistan and this travertine has a variety of colors due to iron and other uh, elemental content. On this floor you'll also see that there's slightly different lining in that in the hallway we have these solar light tubes. The solar light tubes were a project that were also presented and proposed by the students in a sustainability class and we were pleased to be able to implement these as one of our points for attaining LEED certification or being eco-friendly. The solar light tubes actually bring light down into this area. We have to have these up on the fourth floor where they connect up to the roof. We have student gathering areas on each of our floors located on the north and the west sides. Um, on each floor, the gathering areas are painted different colors with furniture to match. And because on this fourth floor, this is the area where we do the surface studies and the water studies, this is why the walls are painted blue and we have this uh, beautiful picture of the ocean floor. We also see that the furniture matches and we've especially picked out these tables to be uh, a mineral that shows um, blue coloration labradorite that actually matches the furniture. Much of western Utah was covered by an ancient lake about uh, 23,000 years ago and this ancient lake was called Lake Bonneville. The remnant of Lake Bonneville is now the current Great Salt Lake. In this particular model we can use a pump to simulate the rise of the water up to the level that Lake Bonneville was at its highest point that's called the Bonneville level that's represented by the bench just under the U. And you can see the many uh, fluctuations of lake level in some of the shorelines that are expressed around the Bonneville Basin. These ancient large lakes are very important for us to understand uh, more about climate change and even to examine some of the analogs of these shorelines to understanding potential shorelines on Mars. The Sutton Building has brought us wonderful gifts and this particular collection of petrified wood uh, came to us because one of our friends read about the building in the newspaper and then called me up to say, I have a very spectacular world-class petrified wood collection that I'd like to see displayed in the Sutton Building. And that's how this particular display came about. One of the fascinating things about this collection was that the family was very good about documenting the localities as well as the age and the formation that these particular examples came from. And so that allows us to be able to use these samples for our research. We can tell what the dinosaurs were eating during the Cretaceous. We might be able to see some of the climate changes that are represented in some of the tree rings of these petrified wood pieces. Or we might be able to see different borings that uh, represent organisms that bored through the wood. Um, all of these things are some of the unusual features that are preserved and we hope will open up new research venues. This is another example of the same garnet storolite schist that is represented outside in front of the building where we have the end piece that uh, is shown. So here you can see a, a cut and polished piece of the garnet storolite schist. Here are some of the examples of the garnets and then you can see these elongate storolite grains. The slab that's behind here is also the same uh, garnet starlight schist, but this is what we call a honed finish. This doesn't have quite as many of the garnets, but you can see the different expression from some of the different finishes that are used on the stone. We're on 
the first floor, which is the basement floor, and that's why we have this particular rock slab. This is a garnet biotite gneiss, and this is typically some of the basement rock, um, what we call geologically the basement rock, and that's why it's placed here. You can also see that in this uh, area we have some of the department collections. Our collections are quite extensive and often used for research. Some of them are organized by the uh, types of fossils and others are arranged by the geologic column from the Precambrian up to the present uh, through geologic time. On the outside of the building you'll see a pattern of cross bedding uh, in the concrete foundation. The cross bedding is placed there because it goes with our river theme. It's the kind of structure that rivers would leave behind. These are custom terracotta medallions that were made in the 1920s, specifically for the mines building. You can see the large uh, hammer and pickaxe, and these large medallions were at the very top of the old 1927 mines building. This is our connection to the past. When we were looking for things to salvage, uh, we wanted these distinctive medallions. And these are placed here so that when people ask what happened to the mines building, they can actually see and connect back to some of the history. These medallions were very heavy and they were placed in with um, large bars that actually go through the side holes. It was very difficult to extract these and it would take a crew of uh, five men on scaffolding. It would take them about a day to wrestle these down. We did manage to uh, salvage all six of the medallions. At the University of Utah Seismograph Station, we've been monitoring earthquakes along the Wasatch Front for over a hundred years. The technology has changed dramatically. Um, in the early part of the 20th century, a lot of the earthquakes were measured on this smoke paper where you can see how the earthquake um, response is etched into the smoke paper. From the 1970s until about 2009, we were using some of this technology which shows some of the helicorders. These are rotating drums that have paper and then there is a pen that had to be filled in with ink that re would record some of the strong ground motion. Although this kind of technology still works, we can now use some of the digital imagery and we can record all this information through computers and display it on screens in a variety of different formats. This is a metamorphic rock and this is one of the few slabs that's from Australia, which is why this one is down under, down under the stairs that is. Um, this metamorphic rock uh, is very colorful and at times you might see tape put on here and there might be different portions that students are studying to better understand metamorphic relationships. This is our connection to the past and this represents uh, the mines building. This is our time capsule bench. Um, on this time capsule bench you'll see this end pedestal is actually the cornerstone of the mines building that was erected in 1927. When looking at this particular uh, cornerstone, we knew that it was something that we wanted to salvage, but my husband said it looks a little bit like there could have been a time capsule here, the way the uh, brackets are, are placed and put on. We had the uh, historian of the university look up some of the records, and in the crony, the daily paper from 1927, it said that a time capsule had been placed at the cornerstone. That was an exciting thing for us to look for, and when the building came down and they carefully took out the cornerstone, we found that there was a little copper box that had been placed here at the cornerstone. Not exactly inside, but just sitting right on top, surrounded by brick. Um, inside the copper box were um, various items. Some of these items inside the copper box included the catalog, the university catalog from 1927, some mining statistics, pictures of the Kennecott copper pit, and other uh, remembrances of the time. We decided that this um, time capsule should stay um, associated with the cornerstone. So what we did here was we excavated out the cornerstone, placed the copper box back down inside. On this side of the um, bench we have another time capsule that we did for 2009. We had a similar piece of the quartz monzonite uh, from the Little Cottonwood stock at the mouth of Little Cottonwood Canyon. We had this uh, custom done and we excavated out the inside and then inside this particular pedestal we placed a stainless steel box with the program and some of the other mementos from our 2009 second grand opening. This time capsule bench is a remembrance of the past. On the front of this 
bench, we also have some other remembrances of the Mines building. These tiles were in the wainscoting of the hallways in the old Mines building. They were covered with three layers of paint and I had my family help excavate these out, ship them out of the, uh, off the walls, and then we boiled them in water to get the three layers of paint off. These tiles are known as arts and crafts tiles made by the Batchelder Company in Los Angeles. They are highly collectible and prized for some of their unique characteristics and the colorful matte finish. These have been placed uh, inside the bench and represent another memory of the Mines building. On this west wall, we have this honey-banded limestone, which is a travertine that's translucent. These particular slabs are from Iran, and these are what we call matched bookends. So it's a little bit like a book where it can open up, and you can have mirror images where the inside is actually polished. These particular slabs were placed here to hide the view of the cooling towers outside, but also on this western face when the sun is up in the afternoon, it shines through and makes these glow a very bright orange. These displays then are dynamic at different times of the day and have different kinds of perspectives and views.